Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming and special thanks to Howard Banjo and Kim Budolf for inviting me, um, a humble children's author, to come and speak to you today. Um, I got interested in classics uh, over 40 years ago when I was 18 years old and I read this book. I come from California, not known for its classical background. Um, <laughs> And this book blew my mind, and uh, because of this book, uh, that started me on a lifelong love of classics. I went to UC Berkeley and started Ancient Greek. Um, I, they then said, oh, if you do Greek, you have to do Latin, so I did Latin. Um, I later got degrees um, from Berkeley, um, Newnham College, Cambridge, and UCL in Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and classical art and archaeology. Um, but however, I discovered that I'm not an academic by nature. That doesn't suit me. I have an 11-year-old mentality. So um, what I did was I took a small break after Cambridge and then um, started teaching secondary school, uh, primary school and that, I loved that. I just loved that. But it was utterly exhausting. And so I finally, about 20 years ago, hit on the idea, why don't I do what Mary Renault did for me and teach kids through my books? So that's what I was able to do. And my first light bulb moment was my sister said, why don't you write a book for kids set in Pompeii? And that was uh, the beginning of my Roman mystery series, which is like, kind of like Nancy Drew in ancient Rome. Um, and that was, there were um, 17 books in that series. Um, there they are, plus two volumes of short stories. I had a huge fun decade writing and researching those. I then wrote some spin-offs for younger readers. I wrote a couple of Virgil retellings. I did some spin-offs for older readers. They actually televised it um, a few years ago, oh, 10 years, 12 years ago. Ah, time flies. <laughs> Huge fun working on that um, a bit. And my latest book um, is um, The Time Travel Diaries. And essentially, um, what authors have, and what I'm going to do today is share how ideas from the Museum of London displays at the Museum of London and the Mithraeum inspired this book. Authors have two problems. One is coming up with ideas, and two is what do you do with the tricky middle part of your book, which many Hollywood screenwriters call the fun and games part. Essentially, I'm teaching through my books. I've got to get kids to read the book, which I fill with all the detail that I love to read about, but I've got to have a strong narrative structure. Um, one of the ways I get inspiration is I spend a lot of time in museums. This is my home away from home. Sorry, Museum of London, but <laughs> this is where I invite friends and fans to come meet me. And I literally am there at least two or three times a month. Um, and I get a lot of ideas from museums. In 2015, the Museum of London had an amazing display of four Roman Londoners whose bones had been DNA analyzed for their DNA. And um, from ADNA, we can find out things like the eye color, the mother, and even hair color sometimes. Kids love that sort of stuff. We love that sort of stuff. Um, I don't have time to tell you about the Harper Road woman who presented as a woman that has DNA of a man, how amazing it would be to write about her. She was 29 years old-ish when she died in the time of Boudicca, though no trauma, so we don't know if she actually died in the, um, in the um, uprising. Uh, a skeleton, one of the other skeletons, a male skeleton, had a big bash in his head, but he was probably a gladiator. So I'm moving quickly on to the Lance Street team. This was one of the four skeletons that they displayed. And she was fascinating. Um, I write for kids aged 8 to 12, so the Harper Road woman would have been fascinating, but that could have caused some problems. Um, so this skeleton is of a 14-year-old girl Here's a nice map from the Museum of London's Roman Dead exhibition uh, last summer. And like many Roman towns, like every Roman town, they buried the dead outside. As you know, the red bits show cemeteries. Um, in the south, south of the Thames, it was very marshy then, with a lot of marshes and islands and eots, or however you pronounce that, eots, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Anybody know? Eot? Eot? Anybody yeah. know? Eot? Eot? Eight? Ayat, <laughs> tomato, tomato. Um, they dis um, workmen um, were digging the foundations of a new building at Lant Street near Borough Tube, um, about half a mile south of Shakespeare's Globe. They were building these new buildings on the left by um, a primary school. 
And they found a Roman graveyard dating from the 2nd to 4th century. And in that Roman graveyard, there were 84 inhumations and two cremations. Out of all the um, nearly 80 burials, one stood out. It was a 14-year-old girl buried with two glass perfume bottles up by her head, an inlaid wooden jewelry box, but no jewels at her feet, and at her hip, a copper, tiny copper key, and the most fascinating item of all, an ivory and iron knife in the shape of a leopard. And there it is on the, on the cover of the Roman burials in Sodek book. Um, obviously, because that's a really exotic grave goods burial, they sent her DNA to be tested. And a DNA, ancient DNA, as I don't have to tell you, told us she had blue eyes and was, uh, had a European mother. Um, we also know just by looking at her teeth that she had bad breath and she had bad periodontal disease, huge cavities. She probably had bad breath and she was probably in constant pain. Her legs were slightly bowed and we gather that she had rickets, a vitamin deficiency caused either by swaddling a baby, which we know the Romans did, or by being kept out of the sun, which we know Romans did with women. So either or both of those might have caused the rickets, which was improving. Um, we know from stable isotopes, there's Rebecca Redfern doing a nice written in bone exhibition um, workshop. Her isotopes tell us her diet, and they tell us that until she was about nine, she was eating a southern Mediterranean diet, perhaps even North Africa. But at the age of nine, her diet changed to a London diet. So she must have made the long journey from North Africa, I like to think, all the way to Britannia. Imagine making that journey in the third century AD um, to the edges of the Roman Empire on a little wooden merchant ship or whatever. Um, we know then, obviously, she died five years later, aged 14. We don't know how she died, sadly. There's no, um, no clue in the bones as to her death. I wanted to know more about her. I wanted to know, how did a half European girl end up in North Africa? You probably already have ideas. I wanted to know, why did she make the long and dangerous journey from the Southern Med to Britannia, to Londinium? I wanted to know what was actually in the perfume jars. Was it perfume? Was it something else? What about the key and what about the knife? What did it signify? And most of all, who, sh who was she? So obviously, as an author of fiction, I can make it up. I can take all the clues and put them together and come up with a possible scenario. Is that not what we do? <laughs> it's what I can do because I don't have anybody over me telling me what to do and what not to do, which is fantastic. There she is, quite gruesome. There's one of the beautiful little glass bottles about that big, about the size of your thumb, and the lovely knife. So around the time I was thinking about the blue-eyed girl with the ivory knife, as I started to call her, I visited London's newly reopened Mithraeum in December 2018, almost two years ago, or two years ago. And um, as you all know, of course, Mithras was that mysterious composite god who appeared in the late first century, or first century, I won't say late, around the same time that Christianity appeared. He survived for about two centuries, um, then he kind of died out. And it was a mystery religion, which I'm sure you know means all about curating the soul once it's died. Like all mystery religions, you are not allowed to divulge what went on. Um, so we only have a few mysterious and tantalizing images, including this one of the god Mithras in kind of quasi-Persian garb, a stabbing, not killing necessarily the bull. There are a few scholars who think stabbing a bull in the shoulder won't kill him, it will just enrage him. Um, and you can see, by the way, that the illustrations from my, based on my photos by Sarah Mulvaney um, have been, we're using those in the book, and that's a really great way of bringing kids in as well. Um, and the London Mithraeum, as I'm sure you know, has been restored to almost its exact original spot, seven meters below the current street level, in the basement of Bloomberg's new European headquarters. One of many clever designs conceived by the team archaeologist Sophie Jackson, at the head of the team, are markings on the black marble stairs going down. Um, they show the street levels of the past, the Blitz in 1941. As you get further down, you get to the Great Fire of 1666. As you go further down, you get to the crowning of uh, William the Conqueror in London in 1066 and so forth. 
And that reminded me that as you go down, you often go back in time. And that gave me the idea of time travel. Because I knew for this new book, I'd written 30 books set in the past. I knew for this new book, if I wanted it to be interesting and compelling, I had to do something different. And so I thought time travel. Now, that's been done by many authors, but not by me. Um, at first, I thought I'd call it Ways to Die in Londinium, because I thought London would have been a horrible place to live. This is a, a screenshot from a great film called How to Be a God, which if you want to get an idea of what London was like, go watch that. Um, but my publisher said, no, that's too um, dark. Then I wanted to call it The Girl with the Ivory Knife. My publisher squashed that idea on account of London knife crime. <laughs> we finally came up with the generic, but since what it does on the tin title of the Roman Time Travel Diaries. And I decided to make my protagonist a boy, a 13-year-old boy, a 12-year-old London schoolboy, mainly because I've got a girl as the quest and male protagonists garner a bigger audience. To keep reading, uh, keep, keep kids reading a book full of archaeology, I have to use a lot of tropes and tricks that fiction authors write. Um, and you can see from the first page, I've got the hero, I've set up the hero's problem, his desire, his um, plan, and an opponent, a bully who um, mugs him for his crisps. And on the next page, I've got what writers call the inciting incident. Authors have to make it hard for their heroes. I've given him f three rules of time travel, naked you must go and naked you must return. Drink, don't eat, and as little interaction as possible for obvious reasons if you're traveling back in time. Um, I met, um, anyone know who that is? Ben Aronovich, Rivers of London author, who I met at a Mithraeum event. He inspired me to create the mentor. Every good quest story has a mentor, a character who sends the hero on a journey. And he's a bit like a cross between me and Elon Musk. He's a bazillionaire who's fascinated by the past. And he's got um, his, his little tech guys have invented the time machine. So he's obsessed with the girl with the ivory knife for various reasons I invented. Adults can't travel back, but prepubescent kids can travel back. So he sends Alex back. Um, other things that have inspired me, oh, he can't give him a talisman. Most mentors give the hero a talisman. So he gives him a talismantra. And we've got some great um, illustrations. Alex must cross a threshold, he gets swept down the the wall brick into the Thames and ends up in Southwark, and he's got to get back across. Of course, he's got to make a visit to London's. Uh, he's got to cross the threshold, which is a time portal in the basement of the Mithraeum. He's got to go naked out of the Mithraeum. He's then got to visit the amphitheater, because you have to visit the amphitheater. In fact, I have him visit all the sites you can see today, including a bathhouse. Just to finish, crossing a threshold in the middle story, I got the idea for this scene where Alex and two friends walk along the side of London Bridge because it's traffic jammed from these bikini bottoms, leather bikini bottoms found in Roman London and now in the Museum of London, juxtaposed right next to a cool model of ancient uh, Roman, the port of Roman London, and that gave me the idea of girl acrobats walking along the side. The Roman Dead Museum um, exhibition gave me a lot of ideas about sound and about smell and about touch, which is reflected in the illustrations, and about witchcraft. What were they? They were doing a lot of witchcraft and superstitious stuff. I was actually able to sit in on some of the written in bone sessions. And I actually, when the proof came out, I hosted a fun session at the Museum of London where me and a bunch of kids brainstormed ideas about how to die in London. And finally, not finally, almost finally, the Museum of London actually sponsored the launch of my book with a live feed to um, hundreds of schools all over the world. I say all over the world. There were a cute few outside England. And recently, just this summer, the wonderful Jackie Kiley put a special little case in the Roman Gallery of the Museum of London showing the girl with the ivory knife's grave goods and a little bit about my book. Um, so I don't know what, um, what I've done for the Romans. They've done a lot for me. <laughs> They've given me a really great living for the last 20 years, essentially. But what I do hope is that through my books, especially this book, The Time Travel Diaries, that I'll inspire kids age 8 to 11 um, and that, after all, they're going to be the, um, the historians, the um, archaeologists, the classicists of tomorrow. Thank you very much.